one of the many springs around Gainesville. It's called Manatee Springs. It's full of these massive animals called manatees swimming in the water. And uh, the water is transparent, absolutely beautiful. Wow. Uh, okay. The North uh, so is very special. Yeah. Uh, so maybe I'll just uh, begin. So hello, everyone, to this uh, session. Uh, so the next two talks, I'll help uh, conduct them. So the first speaker for this session is Professor Sean Mann. Uh, so here is a brief background about him. I'm sure many of you know about his accomplishments, but here is a quick summary. So Professor Sean Mann is well known for his research on stochastic processes and their applications. His award-winning monograph, Marco Chains and Stochastic Stability with uh, Professor Tweedy is now a standard reference. In 2015, he and Professor Anna Busik received a Google Research Award recognizing research on renewable energy integration. He's an IEEE fellow and an IEEE Control System Society distinguished lecturer on topics related to both reinforcement learning and energy systems. After 20 years as a professor of ECE at the University of Illinois, he joined the University of Florida, where he is currently a professor and holds the Robert C. Pittman Eminent Scholar Chair at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. He holds an INDRIA International Chair to support collaborations in France and a Mercator Fellow to support collaboration with colleagues at the University of Potsdam, Germany. Uh, so today, Sean, Professor Sean Mann will be discussing his work titled ZAPQ Learning with Nonlinear Function Approximation. Uh, so we are indeed uh, honored to have you here, Professor Sean Mann. Uh, you may please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kudo. That's, that's very nice. Um, yes, this is... Uh, And um, it's a collaboration with uh, my colleague Anna Bushic, who was mentioned, and my former students now, Shuang Chen and uh, Aditya Devaraj. Uh, Aditya is grew up in Bangalore, by the way, and uh, he's on, on the job market. <laughs> so he's currently a, a postdoc at uh, Stanford, and he'll be uh, moving on next year. And finally, was a current student. So the two references here are the paper that, that I mentioned. The title is uh, from a NERPS paper that, that appeared last year. And then my new book, which I'm very excited about. And so if you look at chapters four and five, in a deterministic setting and nine and 10 in stochastic, you'll see a, a longer development of what I'm talking about uh, right here. Um, so, um, so, th so there's millions of references at the end of this document, which I'll share. Uh, many thanks to the Simons Institute, uh, which helped to accelerate some of this research in 2018 when Aditi and I were there. And of course, NSF and other research authors who helped support this research. And also many thanks to the Indian Institute of Science. So uh, in, in the uh, late 90s, my first sabbatical with Vivek Borkar at the ISC, and uh, absolutely was life-changing. And um, I'm sorry to everyone at ISC, I couldn't get a better photograph. My daughter, there were hardly any pictures of me in the pictures in India. But we spent nine months at ISC and uh, had a wonderful time. So there's my daughters, Sydney and Sophie, and, and uh, Ranjita, their friend, uh, is, they're still friends today. Um, yeah, I still have more memories of Mick Sagar across MG Road and the coffee board and uh, Thank you, ISC. Um, and, it's, you know, and it's fantastic you're putting together this great workshop. Okay, so I've got a, a, a big, I mean, this is sort of nothing for somebody who's an expert in stochastic approximation, but I'm assuming most of you are not. So this is supposed to be a tutorial, and I have to start at the beginning, which is again stochastic approximation, which looks like a scary area, but it's not. It's about OD approximations, nothing more. And once you understand what stochastic approximation is, this thing that's called ZAP stochastic approximation is pretty obvious in a way, even though it wasn't obvious to us at the time. And so then that leads into how to basically ensure stability when you're applying <coughs> reinforcement learning algorithms or other optimization algorithms with neural network approximation. So it's pretty surprising you can do that. I'll explain this lecture how we can. Okay. Um, so what is stochastic approximation? Um, so it's always a root finding problem. So we have some function, 
which, which is defined by an expectation. So I've got this F bar of theta with some expectation of another function where W is random. And we want to find a root, the theta star is a root. And so obviously in optimization, um, F bar would actually be some sort of gradient. Because we, this would be a first order condition for optimality. I'm not going to talk much about optimization today, <clears throat> except for in one example. So in reinforcement learning, most of the time, <clears throat> the root finding problems have nothing to do with optimization, uh, even, if, even if they appear to. And, and we probably won't have a time for a debate on that if anybody disagrees, <laughs> but I, I can back it up. Um, and so the first step, I would say, is to write down an ordinary differential equation and, and hope that it's globally asymptotically stable in the sense that the um, solutions to this ODE converge to the stationary point for each uh, initial condition. Okay, so what, you know, what you're doing is interpreting this as a, a, as a characterization of a stationary point for an ODE. Um, and uh, so that's, 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 that's really the first step. And the next step is, does an Euler approximation work? You know, is it Lipschitz? So if you've ever taken a course in ODEs, you remember looking at Euler approximations and the Lipsch Lipschitz conditions to ensure uh, that this actually approximated the ODE. Um, and then you do it. So basically, once you say that's okay, you go through and you just take, you replace F bar with this random object here, where these W ends have the same distribution as W for all M. It might be an approximation. It might be that W N is a function of a Markov chain or has a mixing, you know, it's asymptotically stationary, um, and that's it. So that's the definition of stochastic approximation along with the motivation, all right? And the point is, is that you can add and subtract this. Um, you know, you can, you can write this um, as just the original F bar of that M plus noise. It's persistent loud noise because it might be high variance from W, um, but the fact is, is that Euler approximations are very robust. Um, and that is the, the reason that convergence theory is easy. Is because Euler approximations are robust. Under Lipschitz conditions. Right. And, and there's no better person to, to tell you about that than Vivek Borkar, who has a, a second edition of his book coming out. So you'll, you'll see in his new edition that, you know, it's like under almost minimal conditions, this works, you know, theta and will converge to theta the star. And so it's just a wonderful tool. Now the rate of convergence, that's not so easy. Right. Okay. Um, and so I'm saying this again. So Euler approximations are robust to measurement error. That's that's it's been you know when I was a graduate student, stochastic approximation seemed very very difficult, and it's because the theory was much more mature. I mean, it was back in the '80s, <laughs> and it's just amazing how much progress has been, and now it's just you know incredibly uh, simple and beautiful theory. Um, so um, again, like I said before, for references. I would, your first step is to look at Vivek Borkar's monograph and ask him for his, uh, a draft of the second edition. All right, so, so um, this is then what I would call the, the ODE method. And I, I, I wanna fight back with the historical definition of the OD method, which is to say, somebody's giving me a horrible algorithm, like some, you know, just some bunch of layers of equations and I'm supposed to understand it. And so Lenny Gunn back in the, uh, in the 80s, 70s or 80s said, okay, let's take these horrible equations and try to understand them by looking at an OD that looks similar. I think that's backwards. And most of the time when we come with an algorithm, we're inspired by an ODE. 
I think, I think that's true in 99% of the cases. So we should think of that as a design technique. The step one of OD algorithm design should be design F bar, all right? Um, and I think that's, again, that's what we really are doing, even if we don't know it. <laughs> um, and then you have to modify dynamics and spoiler alert, that's what the entire lecture is about, is, is one approach I'm gonna go into depth in about modifying dynamics to ensure stability and fast rates of convergence. Uh, and I'll hint at other methods, but I'll, I'll focus on one. All right, so that's that's today's lecture. Or tonight, because I know I'm, I know many of you in India or Europe. Um, and then there's an issue of gain selection. Now, here's you know here's a really really subtle point. One standard gain selection. So there's a gain here gain of step size. Um, I've promoted like one over N because I've been obsessed with this optimal rate of convergence. And I have to admit that I, I'm gonna to explain today why I think I'm kind of wrong. <laughs> um, we'll have a discussion about that maybe if we have time. Um, but this does give the optimal convergence rate uh, of one over N for the mean square error. Um, and you can even identify the constant in an approximation. Um, and, and by this, I mean that if you take n times the error, that converges to this as n goes to infinity under conditions. Now, the theory there is not as mature. You know, that's still a work in progress. I still work on that topic. But the big caveat is that you need this to be Hurwitz. So you need large, you need G to be sufficiently large. So you gotta crank up the game, right? But it's wonderful that we have this result. We have, you know, for free, a way of thinking about rates of convergence. And the, the matrix is a very simple form, this matrix signal theory. Okay, this covariance. So Professor Main, I had a quick question. Yes. Is it okay for yes. you? So what is this capital sigma of theta? So it's, a, well, it turns out, well, I think on the next slide I gave a bit, yeah. So it's, um, um, it's a covariance matrix and actually the CL, I think I said in a, a couple of slides later, the CLT often also holds that the square root of M times theta N minus theta star converges in distribution to a, a Gaussian random variable. Um, and so that's what it is. I mean, it's the it's the covariance in the in the central limit. Thank you. you know, under conditions. Is that is that answer your question? Yes, I, that answers my question. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And again, it's uh, under conditions. Like I said, convergence is incredibly easy to verify. Conditions under which this holds is not. It's still primitive, if you ask me. Um, and um, yeah, I know right here, CLT, et cetera. And what's really beautiful is that you can actually compute sigma theta if you know a few primitives. If you know the, um, you know, the, the Jacobian of this function f bar at theta star, which you can estimate. And if you know this, this covariance of the noise, which is itself a CLT covariance, um, that's the, you know, it's a CLT covariance is itself. So you, you end up writing down the noise. If it, if it, if it itself is asymptotically stationary, it satisfies a central limit theorem itself, then it has a CLT covariance itself. And that's what I mean by this signal noise. Um, I, I can't, of course, I don't have time for full details. All right. But you saw this lay up in a function. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, um, um, so as I've said before, what was the mistake here? Ah. Look at this. I forgot I squared it in. Oh my God, the typo. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a typo throughout. 
Okay, so how do you do an analysis? I, I, I need this, unfortunately. I'm gonna have to paste this in the slide. So what I'm gonna to try to do now is explain to you why, yes, G over N gives you the optimal convergence rate, but there's big warnings here because when you compare, um, so um, um, when you compare the solution to the ODE, with the estimates you get, with the estimates that you get from the recursion, which is right here, there's a time scale involved and you get that by summing up the step size sequence, okay? And that's gonna to lead to a huge warning. Um, so it could be that, again, the solutions to the ODE converge exponentially quickly, but because we're, TN grows so slowly, we get, we get into trouble. And I'll just, um, I'll, just, I'll put a one over in here, that, that's not efficient. <laughs> um, but, but what happens is that, you know, again, this TN goes to zero so slowly that we get jump. Um, and, you know, it, it may be that, that, you know, theta NT, the, the one here, this fancy theta, And, and nonlinear dynamics makes this really hard because as, as I'll show you in one example, okay? So there's it, just two factors here. There's, um, there's here there's like, there's, um, here we have the variance, which uh, is, contributes to error. But here we have really it's, what it is is it's bias, you know? Because I know that these guys are close together because Euler approximations are robust, but this guy is far from big to star. And so that, that there's the bias. So there's a variance bias trade off where we have tricks to, to deal with them, but you have to know this very well to understand the tricks. Okay. Uh, and uh, somebody else is looking at chat for me, right? Yeah. Okay. So. Um, so this is just saying this again. So um, the sta a standard step uh, size choice is a little more gentle than I said. You take a, a, a gain G over N plus one, and take it to the row, the power of rho, where rho is less than one, less or equal to one. And if in, it's an example I'm about to show you, if theta N is far from theta star, you'll need a large value of G. And if theta is close to theta star, you might need the gain to be very, very small. And, and this is bias. And this is variance. And this is a source of, of, of trouble. This te apparent tension is a source of real trouble in this area in, in reinforcement learning, machine learning, all over the place. Okay, so here's a really cool example. So let's look at an example of stochastic gradient descent where uh, I've got a function, which I'm calling L bar loss function, which is of this form where this is random, this phi is random and, and, and say stationary. So phi is a random you know, stationary process, say Markov chain or whatever. And I designed this problem to create trouble this example to create trouble. So you'll see that this function, um, its gradient, negative gradient is the F bar we're looking at. And it has a very steep slope here. You know, near the equilibrium. So F, uh, theta star equals zero. So it's just a one dimensional example. Um, but the overall slope is minus one is very, is very shallow, okay? And, um, and this, you'll see this, this leads to all sorts of trouble. It's really a fun example. Um, 
So if you go through and you look at the ODE, again, this, this, again, this script, this is always a solution to the ODE. The best bound I can get globally is something like this, a constant times n to the minus 0 0.34 um, times the gain. And that 0 0.34 is coming here. You have to play around with the geometry a bit. Uh, that's the best bound I can find with this form. I bet I can make this into a one with a little bit of cleverness, but, um, but that, would, that would be a lot of work. Um, and so there's the bias. If I don't make G large, I'm gonna have a big bias. All right. um, so in fact, if I, I want I, G bigger than two approximately, um, because I wanna be able to make sure that the bias decays faster than one over square root of n. Um, but if you, because the slope here is minus four, one over that is the best locally that minimizes the variance. So there's again this tension. Okay. All right. So, so uh, Professor Main, I had a question. Yes. So if I understand correctly, this calligraphic B tau n is the solution of the ODE, right? Yes. And Absolutely. Uh, every time you see this fancy thing, it's the solution of the ODE. And uh, what is the step size that you are using here? In particular, uh, the tau n is the sum of these step sizes, right? So I'm a bit surprised. Well, yeah, How did you get an inverse polynomial? inverse polynomial convergence rate? Um, well, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm taking this to be alpha k and, uh, and that's approximately equal to G times the log of N. If- um, Oh, you are choosing the one over K N type step size. Equals okay. G over K, that's right. Yeah, G over K. Okay. Yeah, but it's, it's much bigger if it's, it's much, much bigger than that if you put in a row. Yeah, yeah. I, right. I was under the impression that you are under the next, I mean, under alpha k equals g over k raised to rho. Okay, so now I understand. Yeah, that, well, that's what we're gonna, yeah. Um, um, oh, yeah, 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 I should say, Oh, excuse me, I should have said for row equal. Oh yeah, I did say that, row equals one. That's right. For row equals one, we get this, uh, this potentially large bias unless we crank up G. Um, okay, cool. Um, but then if we, again, yes, I should, I should remind all of you that. Okay. Um, now, if you make row less than uh, less than one, that we don't have, we have something much much faster. So here's a here's a fun example here. So if I take the the this is optimal for the variance the variance. Um, let's zoom in here. Let's compare again the ODE and the stochastic approximation algorithm, and after a million samples, this tau k only makes its way here, which is 2.8 seconds. <laughs> you know, you don't move, you know, and you can imagine, a, you know, a billion samples isn't much better. A trillion samples is much better. You're stuck. It doesn't work. So even though you're optimizing the variance, you get an algorithm that's worthless. Well, if you make rho 0.9, then you move a bit faster and you further. And if you make rho equals 0.8, then you make, you get uh, tau equals 11 seconds, you know, and that's fast enough to just nail it. So the bias is, is really, really clear in this example. Um, you don't want to use g equals 1, 4, it's ridiculous, right? Um, but it all depends on the initial condition. I mean, if you knew that you were near zero, you can initialize there and the bias wouldn't be so bad. Okay, so is that message clear? This bias variance trade-off. Okay, now some of you are begging to tell me, Sean, you're an idiot, there's a way to fix this. So 
I'm about to say that, so don't, don't worry. So um, now it turns out the CLT approximation is very, very rapid if you initialize at zero. <laughs> um, so all the theory works, no bias. But if you initialize with say theta is equals 100, as you can imagine, it's meaningless. The central limit theorem, you, you know, takes forever to kick in. So, you, so there's tension, you gotta, you gotta fix it. So I'm gonna talk about a few methods to fix it in this lecture. And time is flying by, so I better move. <laughs> so there's something called Rupert Pollock averaging, which sometimes works. So what you do is, what you do is you make, you take rho, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to slide you. This is not the theory, but in practice, take row between say 0. 0.6 and 0. 0.9. Um, and what Rupert, what, um, what Rupert, Rupert Poliak or Poliak Rupert, um, they, they both introduced this around the same time. Poliak a little bit earlier in Russia, so it should be Poliak Rupert. <laughs> what you do is you average. I'll put Polyak Rupert here. Most trivial thing in the world. You just take your estimates with high gain. So making rho small. Making rho small means you're having higher gain because alpha k is going to zero more slowly. So you crank up the gain, introduce huge variance, and then that gets rid of the bias that has cranks up the variance. Then you average the results, and guess what you get? Optimal variance every time. So in fact, the theory says any uh, any rho between strictly bigger than a half and strictly less than one will work. In practice, you want to. You, know, you want to keep it further away from one. And whether it's rho equals 0 0.8 or rho equals 0.9, and whether you take g equals a fourth or g equals one of the three fourths, it doesn't matter that much. Um, you, get, uh, you get optimal variance. So, you know, optimal bias, no, no bias, optimal variance. So problem solved, right? Crank up the game, average result, walk home. And you know, it, it's so appealing. You know, you'd think that's true, but but it just isn't true at all. Um, um, I'm gonna like when Aditya Devraj and I tried this out for Q learning, it never worked. It just absolutely never worked. So it's it's magical in this example. It fails elsewhere, and I can't tell you I really understand why. It's really, really, really mysterious. Okay, all right, so that's my crash course on stochastic approximation. Um, I just want to give you, I don't want you to think it's all solved. Averaging is, is a miracle sometimes, but not always. So Professor um, Mind, there is a question in the yes. chat. Uh, so, Professor Bhatnagar would like to know what would happen if we dealt with constant step sizes along with averaging. Oh yeah, well, sure. For constant step size, then you then you know, like for example, with Markovian noise, then the joint process theta k and phi k, then the noise is phi k, would be a joint Markov chain. And and Vivek Borkar and I have, you know, a paper from two thousand where we analyze that Markov chain, and. Um, and there's work to be done there too. <laughs> and the same sort of averaging is a good idea. Um, and you can see, you can see recent work of, well, there's recent work of Jordan actually. But it's only for linear recursion, so it's uh, it's leaving out a lot of the mystery. Um, okay, um, and it's really I mean choosing parameter uh, gain there is really hard. I, I don't really recommend it. I don't I don't 
I don't know why people are so obsessed with constant set sizes. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that. <laughs> okay, so um, with tabular cooling, it's a great example. So I'm showing you two examples. Um, um, I've got, um, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not gonna review what Q-learning is. I mean, it's gonna be a mystery to all of you. Um, I don't care, I just don't have time. Um, so there's something called a discount factor. Whenever you see a gamma, it's gonna be called a discount factor. And if you don't know what that is, it just won't be time to review it. But in, in discounted cost optical control, there's something called a discount factor. And AD stands for Aditya. And you can see that this is a Bellman error. It's, you know, it's a metric, uh, it's a way of thinking about the error in dynamic program equations that come up in Q-learning. And you can see his gain fails, you know, his Bellman error stays at around 85 forever. He, you know, shame on you, Aditya, aha. Uh -huh. um, and then if you choose something that he proposed in thesis of one of one minus uh, the discount factor, or before that, in Nert's paper in 2017, um, then you get the error going to zero much better. Okay, so this is just about gain selection. This is about the about the bias um, uh, and the variance. Um, mainly, this was consideration of variance. Um, so, uh, Polyak and Uber should come to the rescue, like they did in the last example, right? Um, well, it it fails miserably. No matter, you know, it just completely fails. So you you. You try out Polyak group with Polyak, and you get this, you get junk. Why? I do not know. So it fails, fails miserably. Um, but I'm going to give you a hint at something later on that maybe is a direction of research for the work can explain why. Um, and I, just for a joke, I'm going to give you some mystery. This game wasn't really proposed for the standard Q-learning algorithm. There's a new algorithm called relative Q-learning. And this was the game that uh, Aditya proposed for that algorithm, and it kicks ass. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. Um, and, uh, and so, and the basically, apparently con the condition number, this, this Jacobian F bar of theta star is horrible. And that's, that's you know, must be a source of the problem. And this, <clears throat> this, this relative Q-learning is a way to improve the condition of it. Okay, so there's a, a reference here if you're interested. It's, I'm just advertising it, and this, this was in work. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now in return, I'm gonna explain now a, a way to, another way to deal with both bias, bias and variance, which is new and really exciting. Um, and so the motivation, may, originally for us came with challenges faced with Q-learning, namely, there's no theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you know about tabular Q-learning, this theory, that's about it, you know. And also this is, this is um, when you figure out what F bar of theta is, for like deep Q-learning, you say, why would we want that? So people say, oh, it's a projected Bellman equation. I say, well, that's nice language. What the hell are you talking about? I mean, there's lots of words to promote the objective in deep Q-learning and Q-learning with nonlinear function approximation. Um, but so far, I, there's not, the empirical evidence for why it's a useful goal is massive, but the scientific evidence isn't there yet. So this is still a question. And this solve this out. Okay, and so I do have time. Cool, let's do it. Um, so, um, and and also I don't like this game, this huge game, because I typically like a large discount factor that causes all sorts of volatility that can be really nasty. Um, so basically, here's a beautiful idea. So. We are talking about theta t as being the parameter. Why not throw that parameter away, make a change of variables and call f bar the parameter? Okay. 
if that's a parameter, I can do whatever I want with it. So why not just, just choose a linear differential equation, right? And if I do that, look at that. I get f bar of theta t is equal to f bar of theta zero e to the minus two. You all know how to solve linear differential equations. And so that goes to zero exponentially fast. So all the issues of like nonlinear dynamics, it's linear dynamics, it's all trivial. And this was something that introduced, was introduced in the economics literature, Smale analyzed it in the 70s, and there's uh, uh, ODs for optimization that you can find uh, in the past decade. Um, so that's cool. And, but that you say, well, that's ridiculous. That's not the parameter. F bar of theta was never the parameter, it's theta. Well, you're wrong. <laughs> Why not? You can do whatever you want because we have the chain rule that does become a differential equation for theta. So the real uh, differential equation is, um, is from that. And when we translate, is, and I'll, I'll show that to you in a second. So the stochastic approximation translation of the SOTE E is what's called SAP stochastic approximation. And that is very new. That's just a few years old. And that was uh, introduced by myself and I did at college and developed with uh, my, the colleagues I mentioned before. Um, and so, um, and that's Zapdos, the uh, Pokemon character. And so we're just traveling from the initial condition f of theta zero to zero in a straight line. Just completely, completely trivial dynamics. Okay, so how do you how do you do this? So we have the chain rule, like I said, and so we get a differential equation in terms of theta rather than f bar of theta, and then you get something practical. And the thing the thing that's tricky though is you've got this Jacobian you've got to deal with. It comes from the chain rule. Um, but you can just estimate it online. Um, you can take um, the Jacobian of your current uh, you know, function f, which is available in reinforcement learning. Uh, in neural networks, we'll see you get, you compute this with back propagation. Um, and, uh, and then you have um, this is exactly a stochastic approximation um, of the study. And uh, this is a stochastic, a stochastic approximation algorithm to, um, to estimate this, uh, the mean of this, um, of this uh, matrix um, of AN plus one. And the secret sauce is we want to track A of theta N. And so therefore we need very high gain here compared to this. We need theta n to evolve more slowly than a hat n, okay? And so this is gonna be big. So this would be a lot of variance in this recursion, but then it gets multiplied by alpha n and it gets killed off. So it's really not a problem. Um, and so what you end up with is this high gain algorithm. And, um, and it does work. So you get the, the OD approximation. You can easily show it is exactly what we want. It's just beautiful. And we get this universally stabilized algorithm, you know, as long as we, we can compute this, this Hessian, as long as it's, I mean, we're not gonna do this in a dimension of a million. <laughs> you know, it's not, this is not gonna be what we could be using for, for chess. But you know, a lot of a lot of examples where theta is not dimension one million, where you can do this. Um, and so I write, I always, I always say this: choose theta n equals alpha n equals one over n. I'll explain why in a moment. Um, and in, in numerics, we do this. Aditya claims that he loves rho equals zero point eight five during his thesis. I think now maybe we're rethinking that as I'll explain. Um, so stability again is virtually universal because stability of this is virtually, virtually universal. And, we, and see the notes table for details, but this under minimal conditions, this, this converges. Um, and, so, and so the same, same for the stochastic approximation algorithm. Um, and this is, you know, based on ancient history, 
um, in terms of the way that Rupert and Poliak, their gold standard was this, um, but the gold standard for them was not this at theta t, but this at theta star. And then you don't have stability for it. So what's new here is we have something that's universally stabilizing. That's what's really exciting. So you take some of this awful neural network based Giuliani algorithm where nobody could ever figure out if it's stable or not, except for by trial and error. Here you just know it's stable. So it's, it's really, really exciting to me. Okay. So, um, so what is that Giuliani? So I can't, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm just about done. Um, so, Professor, Mike, there is a question. Yes, 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 please. Yeah, so uh, so the first question I wanted to ask was uh, that, uh, see, you have went from a scalar valued gain function to a matrix valued gain function. Yes. Right? So are you not worried yes. about the computational effort per iteration? So you are sort of increasing the computational effort and then you are saying, uh, you know, the convergence uh, uh, rate improves. So I'm not sure yes. about that. And the other is, how do you... Uh, uh, you know, ensure that this a hat n is invertible for all n. Do we need not not to okay, worry about right. that? So, so yes, yes, yes. So I, I decided I didn't have time for that. In our paper, we actually use an approximate pseudo inverse, and okay. we prove that that's universally stable too. So, um, so even even without invertibility, we don't need it to be invertible. Okay. It has to be, it has to be invertible at theta star, uh, you know, it has to be invertible at the roots of f bar of theta. Uh, that's it. Um, I mean, it's not, it's not even that strong. I mean, you know, the, the conditions are very, very weak for stability. Um, the computational complexity is a real issue. And uh, I, I, you know, luckily in Q learning, uh, this matrix is rank one. Which really, really simplifies them. Um, so that helps a lot. Um, but still, it's an issue. I, I completely agree. Um, but but you're getting this amazing. I mean, so you know, if you can do it, do it. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Thank you. All right. All right. And so yeah, so there's a regularized version. And there's some loss in the optimal variance if we regularize, but it's only if, if regular if it a parameter epsilon regularization, we get a loss of variance of order epsilon squared. So it's you know, not a big deal. Um, so with Q learning, we have this uh, root finding problem, and it's this horrendous, awful mess. So we have a, a state process, an input process that's a cost. The, the gammas are discount factor that I mentioned. Um, and there's something called a Q function here. And this Q bar theta of X is just to equal to min over U of Q theta of X U. Just a notation we introduced to make things easy. Um, and for some reason, it's popular um, to take the gradient of this Q function and, and, and slap it in here, the main thing we want is that this is n-dimensional or d-dimensional. If theta is an ID. So the main point is that by setting this equal to zero, we have d unknowns because theta stars in our d and we have d constraints. And this is called the eligibility vector. In, in reinforcement learning. So you can see, you know, you can see people say, oh yeah, of course you want the gradient because we want to go in the, in the direction that Q is increasing or decreasing, whether we're trying to maximize or minimize it. I'm trying to minimize. So, but but that that argument doesn't make sense because this is not positive or negative. It could be positive, it could be negative. So it's not a, it's not a descent algorithm, no matter what anybody tells you. You know, it's just it's just a hack that turns out it works. So there's a huge frontier to explain why this works. It's it's so amazing that it actually does. Um, and I think that I mean I've been saying this 
you know, for years, and nobody's given me a really uh, strong argument. Um, and oh yeah, this is the value of the here. Um, so it's it's so it's just been beautiful. That's the wonderful thing about reinforcement learning. You have people who have been really brave to come up with one hack after another, try it out, and the ones that work get preserved and get developed. And this is a hack that's worked amazingly well. And so I'm not pleased to know that I, I think it's a, it's brilliant, you know. I just and I think it's exciting that there's an open question we need to explore. But so this is just perfect for Zap. We can just go through and and um, what's inside when we take the, uh, the the derivative of what's inside, it's a rank one matrix. So it's really easy to, to you know uh, implement this algorithm. Um, and uh, um, and, uh, and but you know, even though it's not obvious, this root finding problem is what DQN is doing. So I'm not going to review DQN. The deep uh, Q learning uh, is precisely trying to solve this problem, even though that's not the statement. There's no relationship with stochastic gradient descent, none whatsoever. Now, there is in DQN, there is an optimization problem that comes up. So it makes you think you're trying to solve an optimization problem. But when you look at the resulting OD approximation DQN, which characterizes the possible limit points, this is it. Okay, so DQN solves this problem. It does, it's a theorem, I can give you a reference. <laughs> and many people aren't aware of that, um, but that's what it's doing. Okay. Because it does look like we solve an optimization problem. That's one step of the algorithm, but that's not that's not the ultimate. Um, it's not the ultimate objective in the sense that you are solving this problem. All right, so I'm just going to give you some new notes. Um, now, um, before I make a few more comments, again, we don't know if there even exists a solution. We don't know if a uh, any of these a inverses exist. But we don't need it. Um, essay theory is very weak for discontinuous ODE. So, how to apply that? Well, guess what? You use this change of variable uh, idea. So theta dot, you know, equals, you know, a inverse of theta, f bar of theta, is horribly discontinuous. Um, um, minus. But DDT F bar of theta T is just equal to minus F bar of theta T. And so there's your answer. <laughs> so that's what we're, that was a breakthrough last year. So the NIPS paper uh, is all about um, showing that even though it's a discontinuous uh, um, ODE for ZAP, which is just causes horrible problems, we can still get the same stability guarantees. Um, and, and I'll wrap things up with an example, but I'll, I know I know want some time for questions. Um, so, um, for, for I mean, you know, this this the, the, the original OD Sorry. Again, that is an open question. I think it always will be. It's just too hard. All right, so you can see a NeurIPS video and these two references uh, that I mentioned before, but let me just show you a picture. Um, so here's an example, three examples from OpenAI Gen, the mountain car example, Acrobat, and cart pole. And we just basically took random neural network architectures. And the whole goal here was just to show that Zap just works, okay? You can just plug it in and go and it works. And, um, and this is just showing independent trials and we get you know, different performance. Sometimes it's not so great. Sometimes it's fantastic. 
Um, so we're looking at reward rather than cost because that's what they do at NeurIPS. Um, and it always works, okay? Um, so I'm not showing you failures, but it doesn't fail. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's quite exciting. Um, and of course, there's some computational complexity that opens up new areas for research. So I'm gonna close with just a few uh, comments and open problems, and then we can have some time for questions. Um, so again, a big takeaway is, is this uh, survey I gave you, with variance and nonlinear algorithm dynamics, so both curses to algorithm uh, design. Um, second order methods are magic if you can use them. So if you have an example that's dimensions not too high, why not? Um, and um, in terms of Q learning, this, this projected Bellman error, I, I hope so much we can find some alternative approaches where we have a better intuition of what we're doing. And I think the applications of what I talked about to stochastic optimization are going to be really cool. Um, now, there's acceleration techniques that don't involve matrix inverses. Um, they're also in, in DT's thesis. One is matrix momentum. Very new that I jokingly call Zap Zero, which is in my, my new book. And I want to show you something. So I won't tell you what Zap Zero is. It's some something related to Zap. It's trying to track it without a matrix inverse. Note here, I'm using polycrobert averaging and it's doing very well. Well, guess what? We took rho to be 0 0.1. I'm sorry, Polyak, I'm sorry, Rupert, but we're breaking the rules. There's no theory. <laughs> But it works magically, unbelievable. <laughs> just and so, damn! I can't wait to figure that out. This is this is just a uh, six month, few months old, um, and uh, and so control variance, of course, is something we look at. Um, but yeah, that's it. I, I, I do want to have a few minutes for questions, um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> and, and again, I'll, I'll share this as pages and pages of uh, references for you. Questions. So first of all, thank you, Professor Mind. This was a very uh, interesting talk. Uh, so those who have any questions, uh, please go ahead and unmute yourself and you can directly ask. Uh, hi, uh, Professor Mind. So, so I just had a question. So when, when you said that you would, uh, I mean, so as you rightly said, there's this hack of using the gradient of the uh, Q function. Instead, yeah. So instead of that, if you directly use a vector of all ones, that would work better. Or uh... oh, no, 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 because it wouldn't be full rank. So I, so basically, I need lots of uh, excitation here, um, because um, like if I took a vector of all ones, then the components of f bar would all be the same. So I wouldn't. Because remember, I need, I need uh, d independent. Constraints. Yeah. So yeah, so it's not at all obvious how you des should design this. Um, oh, really again, this is the eligibility vector. Yeah, but what you would like is a theta star for which f bar theta star is zero. Yeah, I mean we want what we want is um, oh yeah, I mean the, the actual goal is we want the conditional expectation of this to be zero. You know, thank God for Apple. Um, you want um, you want the conditional expectation of this whole monster given the history to be zero. That's the goal. Um, and so this is a relaxation of that goal. That, that, that's the goal which is not achievable. I say that because, you know, this is like an infinite, infinite dimensional constraint, but I only have d, d unknown, so it's not achievable. So this is a relaxation. And so the best choice here uh, to approximate this constraint is, 
is what's a, an open open area for research. Um, The natural thing to do would be to somehow approximate this conditional expectation and square it and then try to find you know, a minimum of that. And there's something called GQ learning, which is kind of related to that, but not really. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, Professor Main, I had one question. Uh, so uh, coming back to this original problem that you raised about this variance and bias, right? So I was wondering, uh, you know, instead of using this ZAPQ learning type approach, what would happen if we used adaptive step sizes, right? So adaptive step sizes, meaning when yeah. we are far, we sort of use la longer step sizes. And when we are close, yeah, we somehow yeah. use this thing. Would we, do you think we would get similar uh, uh, advantage or uh, you think this ZAPQ learning is in some sense the optimal that we can do? Well, so on, on the one hand, it's a great idea. Um, and I think we should, you know, um, like, you know, like for example, that G over one over one minus gamma required, you know, a lot of prior knowledge. You know, how to learn it, how to, how to, how to do it. So yes, you know, so I completely agree with you, but two, um, but <laughs> this ill condition is still an issue. So that's why something like a, a second order method, I think is also gonna be needed. Um, you know, like, like if, for example, the fact that polyacropid averaging failed completely for two learning, um, it's, it's all because the, the linearization, one way to think about it is the linearization for QN has a horrible massive condition under it. And that's why a scalar game, you know, you're doing well in some dimensions and not other. Um, so we need a few more degrees.